Hello and welcome to Managing Relational Databases on AWS as part of the AWS Innovate Online Conference. My name is Blair Layton and I'm a Business Development Manager for our database services. The agenda for this session is designed to give you an overview of how you would execute common database management tasks using our managed database services. I'll also show you demos of how to use the AWS console to do these tasks. At the end of this session, you will have the confidence to be able to use Amazon Relational Database Service to manage your relational databases. Why would you use a managed database service instead of running your own database on-premises or even on EC2? Well, have a think about how much time your DBAs and other IT staff spend on provisioning hardware and storage, installing, upgrading, and patching software, looking after documentation, licensing, and training, doing backup and recovery, data load and unload, and lastly, security. Then ask yourself, is that really adding value to the business? If you host your database on-premises today, then you have to do everything in the stack you can see on the slide, from managing the power, cooling, network, all the way through to application optimization. If you host your database in EC2, then AWS can take care of the infrastructure components from the data center up to the operating system installation. But you will still have to perform the operating system patches, database installation, database patches, backups, manage high availability, scaling, and the application optimization. If you choose a managed database service, such as Amazon Relational Database Service or RDS, then the only thing you need to worry about is your application optimization with AWS taking care of everything else. This allows you to focus on what really matters for your business. RDS, given its name, is focused on relational databases. It offers a managed service for MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, MS SQL Server, and Oracle Database. Amazon Aurora is Amazon's own database platform and comes in two editions, one with MySQL compatibility and the other with Postgres compatibility. As a managed service, RDS is easy to administer with no need for infrastructure provisioning or installation and management of the database software. It is highly flexible, allowing you to scale your compute and storage with a few mouse clicks. It is highly available and durable with our multi-AZ capability that keeps a synchronized copy of the database in another availability zone that you can think of as a data center. Daily backups are sent to Amazon S3 with 11 nines of durability, and we also send the database logs to S3 every five minutes. RDS is fast with the ability to use our largest instance, the X1E, with RDS Oracle to give you 128 vCPUs and four terabytes of RAM. You can choose between general purpose and high performance SSD storage too, with up to 64 terabytes and 80,000 IOPS. Now, if I've convinced you to consider using RDS, one of the first things you need to do is plan the sizing of your RDS instance and storage. If you are coming from the on-premises world, then your server is going to be replaced with what we call an instance. This is a virtual machine that can have from one to 128 virtual CPUs, one gigabyte to four terabytes of RAM, and network throughput of up to 25 gigabits per second. Amazon Elastic Block Store, or EBS, is the storage service that RDS uses. In our largest instances, you can get up to 14,000 megabits per second throughput to EBS, your database storage can now be up to 64 terabytes with 80,000 IOPS. On Amazon Aurora, we use a separate storage service that is consistent across three availability zones. Your database can grow up to 64 terabytes with IOPS only limited by the size of your instance. There are five types of EBS storage available for an EC2 instance. But for RDS, we use the two different volume types that are best suited for your database workloads. The first is general purpose storage. This is SSD backed storage that allows you to have volumes from one gigabyte to 16 terabytes with up to 16,000 IOPS. These volumes have a concept of bursting that allows you to have a volume with less than one terabyte to burst to 3,000 IOPS to help manage workloads with high peaks. General purpose volumes provide a baseline of three IOPS per gigabyte. 
So a 500 gigabyte volume would provide a baseline of 1500 IOPS with bursting to 3000 IOPS. We recommend that you start using general purpose volumes for your database workload and then change to the next volume type, provisioned IOPS, if your database requires higher IOPS with a better latency consistency profile. Provision IOPS volumes start at 4 gigabytes rather than 1 gigabyte, but they can grow to the same 16 terabyte limit. A single volume can provide up to 64,000 IOPS with a throughput of 1,000 megabytes per second. With these higher specifications comes a higher price. Hence the advice to start with general purpose volumes unless you are certain that your workload is going to be business critical and must have the best and most consistent performance. When you choose your instance, you need to balance the number of vCPUs, RAM and network performance to match your requirements. For example, there is no point choosing a small instance with one vCPU if you intend on running a database that needs 60,000 IOPS. The network capacity allocated to smaller instances will not allow you to push that many IOPS through to EBS. Our documentation contains a section that talks about this and includes a handy table with the instance sizes and their IOPS limits. Now that you know the basics of sizing your instance, let me show you how to launch one. All right, welcome to the first demo where we're going to launch an AWS RDS instance. This is uh, the console. I'm going to create a database. And here you can see the different engines that we have for RDS. I'm going to choose MySQL for this demo and click Next. Now I'm just going to do a dev test environment here. So that's going to be a single instance and click Next on that. And you can see that there's lots of different versions that we can have in here going back down to MySQL 5.5 up to 8. I'm going to use MySQL 8 for this. Then in the instances, this is the size of the server that you want. So you can see we've got a lot to choose from depending on your needs. Some are more on uh, RAM, some are more on vCPUs. It's really up to you what you want to use. So we're going to use an M5 large, which is two vCPUs and eight gigs of RAM. Then we're not going to do multi-AZ uh, because this is just dev test. And we're going to change the storage that you see here from provision IOPS to general purpose and allocate 500 gigabytes here to give it 1500 IOPS. Now it gives you a guess on the cost and then once you tab out of the storage it updates that. Here we're going to actually put in the name of this particular instance and I'm going to call it Demo Innovate. And then we're going to call the username, my name, Blair, and then put in a password and you have to confirm that password before you can go to the next step. So once we've done that, we click Next and now we get to the advanced settings. So this is the VPC. Now this is the secure component of your cloud that nobody else has access to from a networking perspective. The subnet is where you're going to put this particular database and uh, how many IPs you've got inside there. And then we can choose the availability zone. I don't really have a preference, so we'll leave it as it is. Now for security groups, you can actually choose an existing one or you can create a new one. So I'm gonna choose an existing one and go with the on RDS launch wizard. When we come down, we need to give it a database name. So I'm just going to call this one demo. And then if we come down further, there's a choice for parameter groups and option groups. These are all the things that you can configure for MySQL. I'm just going to go with the defaults. And then you can see there's an IAM DB authentication. This is uh, allowing you to use AWS security to log in. So now we come down to encryption and you can see that it's disabled at the moment and I'm going to enable it for this instance. And then we can choose the default RDS key and then that's all you need to do. You're going to have a database that's encrypted. Coming down to backup retention, you can see that there is uh, the capability here to backup by default for seven days, but you can actually turn it off with zero days or we can go all the way down to up to 35 days for automatic backups. And we'll talk more about that later in the session. So I'll just go with the default and then there's also the opportunity to choose what window you want the backups to occur. Now these are daily, so I'm setting this at the moment to be four o'clock UTC and I'm based in Singapore, so that's going to be in the middle of the night. Then we can look at monitoring. So there's disable enhanced monitoring and then enable it. Uh, if you do enable it, you can set the granularity and it can go down to one second. 
We don't recommend turning this on all the time because it will create quite a lot of records and uh, will cost some more money. So for dev test, often just leave that disabled. You can turn it on again at another time. For logs, I want to uh, put on the slow query log here because this is gonna be a development instance and let's say I wanna focus on slow queries. And then uh, for maintenance, we've got enable auto minor version upgrade or disable it. So in this case, I'm gonna disable it again because it's a dev test instance, I don't need that. But for any other maintenance, we have to choose one day a week where we want this to occur. So I'm choosing Saturday at five after the backup window. And that's when, if there's a maintenance, then we have to do that. And finally, enabling delete protection. Now the database is going to be created and we can go back to the main RDS console. And then we can go and click on our databases and you can see the new one, Demo Innovate, that we just created and it is creating at the moment on that M5 large. The other databases that are here, we're gonna use those for other things today. Now you have seen how to launch an RDS instance, but what happens if you get the sizing wrong or your boss tells you that marketing is doing a promotion and you need to increase the capacity of the database? With RDS, you can scale up and down depending on the business requirements. You can even stop an RDS instance at night, on the weekends or on public holidays, and start it again when everyone comes back to work. This is a great way to manage costs and only provision what you need when you need it. For example, you could use a four vCPU instance during most of the month, but then double the size for month end processing before scaling it back down again. With the open source databases, we allow you to scale reads through the use of read replicas. They can be in the same AZ, a different AZ, or as you can see from the slide, in different regions. You can also promote a read replica to a primary database to allow you to fail over to another region in the event of a major disaster. If you are using commercial databases, you have a few different options to create read replicas. For Oracle database, you can use Oracle Golden Gate or the AWS database migration service. It is similar to Golden Gate, but much cheaper. Both options will give you change data capture technology to send changes from your Oracle database to another target. DMS even supports S3. You can also use other third-party replication products. If your use case doesn't need the latest data, you may want to use a snapshot to restore a database. This might be good for daily reporting that doesn't need today's data. Now I'm gonna show you just how easy it is to scale an RDS instance. Okay, so now we're going to scale an RDS instance. You can see that the existing database that we created just before is already available. And now I'm gonna look at this Innovate Scale database that is running on Aurora MySQL. It has two instances. One is for a writing and the other is a reader. So what we're going to do is it can actually go and add a reader to this if we wanted to scale reads, but we're not gonna do that today. We're going to actually change the writer instance and double its capacity. So I selected that particular writer instance and you can see it's an R4X large. We click on modify and that's gonna bring up all the properties of this particular instance. And then from there, we'll be able to go through and change what we want. So for this particular one, we want to change that to twice the capacity. So click on the next instance in the same family and then all the other settings that are here, we're not gonna change. So we can scroll down and then at the end, there's one little thing that we need to do, click continue and then we need to change this setting. So if you don't change this to apply immediately, it will actually change for the size from the 4X large to the 2X large in the maintenance window. So we're gonna do that straight away. And now what's gonna happen is that instance is going to change to modifying just like that. And then it will go through and execute this change. Now the reader is still gonna be available that whole time. And in fact, what we'll see is that there should be a failover as part of this process to actually change that reader to the writer to minimize the time that the application is down while this is actually doing the modification. Backup and recovery is quite different in a managed service. And that's a good thing as it takes away a lot of the manual work. If you recall from the first demo, when I launched an RDS instance, there was the ability to change the automatic backup time and retention period from the default value of seven days to anywhere from zero to 35 days. This is the primary way RDS protects your database instance 
from planned or unplanned events. We also archive the database change logs to S3 every five minutes. That allows RDS to restore your database to a point in time with no more than five minutes of data loss in the event of a major event such as user deleting data or storage related problems. Because the backups and change logs are stored in S3, you can restore an instance to any availability zone. User snapshots are similar to the automatic backups, but they have no retention period. Thus, you can set weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly backups that are under your full control. It's also a good idea to take a user snapshot when you are doing major changes like patching, upgrades, or schema modifications. Both the automatic and user snapshots remain encrypted if you turned on encryption for the database storage. Snapshots can be used for many different use cases. You may want to create a copy of production to diagnose production-related problems. You could create dev test environments from one gold snapshot or copy production into UAT. If you are deleting a database, you should take a final snapshot. You can even send snapshots to another region for cross-region disaster recovery. Lastly, you can also copy snapshots between accounts, which is useful if your development and production accounts are separate. Now you know the basics of RDS backup and recovery, let me show you just how easy it is to restore an RDS instance. Okay, so we're back at the console and after we did the last demo, we can see now that something has changed. The longer version of the host name was the reader has actually changed and the one that was the writer has now been increased the size, the 2x large, but it is the reader. So this is what's happened, as I mentioned, as part of the previous demo, to keep the database available while we're doing maintenance, we decided to do that failover and make this actually the reader. So you would actually have to do two maintenance events to scale the whole database and make sure that you have everything available. So let's look at the snapshots, because that's what this demo is all about, is we want to look at this Postgres version here that we have and the backups that are available for that. So I can click on that, and then I can restore a snapshot. Now this is going to take that database as it was at that point in time and restore it. So we don't want to actually do that because I want to restore it to a specific point in time, ideally the latest backup that I have. So here, this is the automatic backups, and you can see it says restore to point in time. So if you look down here, you can see when that protect, um, snapshot was actually done, and then you can see with all the logs that we've kept, when it is going to be able to be restored to. So I've clicked on restore point in time, and then what we're gonna see is the latest recordable time. But if I didn't want to do that, I could click on custom and put in a date and time there. Now, of course, I said I want to do the latest, so do, done that. Now, if we come down, we have to actually choose the instance size that we want to restore this to. So I'm going to choose an M4X large, and then we have to decide all the other options that we had before. Now, notice the storage, you don't get an option for the size because it's going to be the same amount of storage that was done on that snapshot. Put in the database identifier, and once we've done that, we go down and start looking at the other options, but there's nothing really here that I want to change either. In fact, all of this is pretty much the same as what we want before. Now for the logs, you could change it, or the maintenance, again, you could change it, but we're just gonna do restore to point in time. So now if we come back to our console, you can see that we have the innovate restore, and that's a Postgres instance on the M4X large, and it's marked as creating. So what's gonna happen is this is going to go and do that normal process of restoring that snapshot, creating that instance, and then making that available and then you'll be able to use that with a new endpoint to connect to that database. Once you have everything running and have your backup and recovery plans tested, you'll start to think about how you manage upgrades and patching. There are two types of upgrades in RDS. One is major version upgrades and the other is minor version upgrades. Major version upgrades is like going from Oracle Database 11GR2 to 12C or MySQL 5.7 to 8. Minor version upgrades are for typical point version changes such as 11.0.2.3 to 11.0.2.4 for Oracle, or MySQL 5.7.19 to MySQL 5.7.25. You can execute upgrades immediately or in the maintenance window that you specified when you launched your RDS instance. 
RDS will take snapshots before performing upgrades in case of problems afterwards. Then you can restore the database to the previous version. Patching is different depending on each engine. For example, Oracle PSUs are available one to two months after Oracle releases them. This allows you to keep the same major and minor version with the additional PSUs. SQL Server will get the same versions with different service packs. MySQL and Postgres users will typically upgrade to a minor version to get patches. But in the past, we have created special versions by adding an A to the end of the version for important security issues. Amazon Aurora offers private patches and private versions that is a superior support experience to the Community Edition-based RDS databases. Now I'd like to show you how easy it is to upgrade an RDS instance. OK, so now we're going to do a database upgrade. You can see that the other restoration is still occurring, and, but we're going to click on the SQL Server database and then look at some of the details here. So you can see where it is and what's your availability zone. Uh, you can see whether it's publicly accessible or not, and so on. Uh, but if you go down further, there's a couple more things here in terms of the security group rules and some replication information. But the thing that's missing is the version. So if I click on configuration, then we've got a lot more information here. So the engine version is 11, and that is SQL Server 2012. So what we want to do is upgrade that, and we click on modify, and then we'll be able to have a drop down list of the available versions. So you can see 2012, I'm going to change that to 2017, and then we don't want to change anything else at all. We're just going to change the database version. So we can scroll down past everything else, and then we can click continue. And again, there's going to be some more information here. So this is telling us that you need to be a bit careful because this is a uh, one-way action. You can't go back after this. Of course, you can do a snapshot, and we will do a snapshot as part of the process. But it is going to upgrade you from SQL Server 2012 to SQL Server 2017. And we want to do that immediately. And again, it reminds you there could be some downtime. So once this is being kicked off, we can go back and look at the information here, or we can go back to the database list and then see what's happening on the console here. And you can see this one is now marked for upgrading, and we've finished the upgrade process. The last operation that I want to talk about is deleting an RDS instance. If you have turned on delete protection, then the first thing you need to do is modify the instance to turn it off. There is a process to make sure that you really want to delete the instance, including multiple prompts and forcing you to type delete me on the console. You will be encouraged to take a final snapshot as part of the process too. While the database is being deleted, you will still see it in the RDS console with its status as deleting. Let's take a look at how to delete an RDS instance. OK, we're back on the console. And what we're going to do is choose a database to delete. And you can see the other one is still upgrading. So we'll go and choose the first one that we uh, created earlier. And we'll go and delete this instance. So you choose Actions and then Delete. Now here is all the warnings and things that you can do. So create a final snapshot and retain automated backups is highly recommended just in case you do need to uh, keep a copy of everything. I'm going to turn them off and show you what happens. You have to then acknowledge that you're not doing any backups. You have to type delete me in here and then click the delete button. So if any DBA comes and says to you, I accidentally deleted your RDS instance, you can imagine that they had to go through and do all of that uh, to make sure that it was deleted. So I don't think it was an accident. So we come back to the databases, and we can now see that this one is marked for deleting, and it is now going to go through and complete the deletion process. That's what I wanted to cover for managing relational databases on AWS. So let's summarize what we have talked about today. Throughout the presentation and demos, you will have seen why managed databases take away the day-to-day -day tasks of managing your database, freeing you up to focus on the application and increasing business value. You have heard about how RDS provides a managed service for a number of commercial, open source, and our own Aurora databases. We discussed how to size an RDS instance and showed you how to launch one, followed by scaling an RDS instance to add more capacity. 
Backup and recovery is one of the most appealing features of a managed database service as it's a tedious and error-prone activity for a DBA. Upgrades and patching are not much fun either, and we showed you how to both recover and upgrade a database using the RDS console. Finally, we showed you how to delete an RDS instance. Hopefully, all of this information has given you the confidence to go and try RDS today to help you manage your relational databases on AWS. If you are interested in learning more about what I've discussed today, you have several options available to you. You can access the digital training and in-classroom trainings built by AWS experts. You can also visit this link for the list of AWS certifications available. AWS has a rich partner ecosystem, and our partners can help your organization at any stage of your cloud adoption journey. This brings me to the end of my session. I hope you found it useful. Do remember to complete the survey so we can better understand your requirements. With that, I would like to thank you for attending AWS Innovate.